collaboration between myself, a Canadian colleague, um, another colleague who works for forestry department in the US, a colleague, my Canadian colleague works with University of Calgary, and then also a, a technical person. He works with, um, with the forestry and agricultural research department here in Ghana. So together we, we carried out this study. Now, as a background to um, the aspect of the data that I have taken to, to, to do this paper, I'm mainly looking at cocoa production versus you know, mining. And as a background, there's a lot of discussion about global cocoa production, and especially the fact that it has doubled in recent decades. So increasingly, most, can, most, most countries that are cocoa producing or, or depend a lot on cocoa production have all gone through a, a, a phase where they have seen increase in their, in their, in their cocoa production. But this hasn't been um, uniform across board. So in Africa, you'd see that um, there are countries that have established themselves as leading cocoa producers. And on the average, um, they, are, they are saying that across the continent, about 2.7% has occurred in cocoa production since 2000. And Western Central Africa especially is accounting for most of this global cocoa production. And in West Africa, we can come straight to Ghana, um, Cote d'Ivoire being on top, Ghana being there, Cameroon being there, Nigeria being there. And the literature tells us that about 6 million hectares of forest zone are actually planted with 70% of the world's total production of cocoa. Now, in Ghana, the focus of cocoa production is more in the forest ecological zone. So you'll find it more in Ashanti, Bono, Ahafo, Western region. And as I said previously, the giants include Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And in Ghana, the yield has actually increased from 300,000 metric tons in 1995 to about 900,000 metric tons in 2014. And the literature points that a lot of factors have contributed, but most especially is the support measures that has been received through um, cocoa board. So government support, increasing farm gate price, bringing hybrid seeds, fertilizers, insecticide, fungicide, improved marketing facilities by going into roads and etc. So these are state policies that have kind of been run out to make sure that cocoa, cocoa becomes even more attractive. So increased yield, however linked to hectare hasn't been as significant as you would see okay so you see that about um one million hectares of land that was being engaged in 1995 has increased to 1.6 million in 2010 but this does not match the kind of yield that you want so you find that um, cocoa production is still as low as 400 metric tons per a thousand hectares so majority of farmers then haven't experienced the growing yields so it is believed that the, the large scale farmers, those who do more intensive and capital intensive cocoa production are the ones who are benefiting from it. But in our part of the world, in Africa and West Africa and in Ghana especially, cocoa farms are small in size. So you find the average sizes are two hectares or less. They don't use capital intensive input. A lot of the cocoa trees are old, some are weak, they, are, they have issues with pest management, they, some use fertilizer, some do high input prices. They have low or no access to credit. So these challenges still face a lot of cocoa farmers, despite the fact that the total production in Africa, in West Africa, in Ghana, is on the increase. And it means that the whole thing is not uniform across board. And the literature actually specifically says that 80% of the small of, of the farmers or 80% of the cocoa industry is actually controlled by these smallholder farmers. These are the challenges they okay. face, and therefore they are not benefiting from the, um, the, the cocoa industry or the growth in the cocoa industry as they should. So as I was saying, from the cocoa sector, we now come to the mining. What is it about mining that makes it such an issue when you come talking about cocoa? So gold, Ghana, Ghana's gold is, is everything that we talk about. In actual fact, Ghana is Africa's second most important producer of gold. We are also third in manganese and in bauxite. So all the other you know, natural resources are competing for land, including cocoa. We consistently have been growing new mines, exploration companies, service related companies. There's actually an intentional growth in the mining sector of Ghana. 
and it's been linked to the fact that we keep getting even more foreign investment. And we're also looking for revenue generation from our taxes, from our royalties. So it's linked strongly to the fact that we will get foreign exchange from it. And the sector has contributed a lot to growth nationally. But the benefits that have been accrued to the ordinary Ghanaian is still very contentious. And we have different categories of mining as well as we have different types of mining. So you have the small scale, you have this um, um, large scale. At the same time, you have the, the, the small scale, otherwise known as artisanal. At the same time, you have the alluvial, deep shaft, open, open pits, and etc. Now, the small scale mining, especially, is being controlled by a sector of society. That seems to be what is most worrying. And it is because there's a, there's a huge aspect of the small scale mining that hasn't been regularized, meaning that they haven't gone through the proper licensing process. And that is what is referred to as the illegal mining on Ghana State. And the huge debate is that it is especially this type of mining that is fighting with, with um, the cocoa industry. So there's a huge debate on the land being able to serve with both purposes. So when it comes to large scale mines and et cetera, then you will delve into compensation issues of um, people paying compensation to cocoa farms. But this study did not delve into it. We are concentrating mainly on small scale mines properly um, um, either registered or not registered, and then the illegal aspect of it and how this is contesting um, with cocoa land. So would the farmer give their land for either of those purposes? That is what we looked at. And there are several studies that have spoken about cocoa growing areas in Ghana and have indicated that Galamsi has actually tripled between 2011 and 2015 in these cocoa growing areas. So there's a lot of evidence, and especially it is even more common around um, along river networks. And if we map out the cocoa producing um, regions in Ghana, you realize that a lot of them are also close because they, they, they are in the agroforestry zone, and a lot of them have these same rivers and water streams network going through them. So there's a strong linkage between what Galamsi have, I mean, the, the occurrence of Galamsi and the farmlands that are also used for cocoa. There was this very interesting publication that actually brought my attention to this issue. In March, I think there's a typo, there was March 2018. There was a publication on Kweku Asari of Dintra, Isikuma, and it had this very um, amazing picture that just shouts at you and tells you that many cocoa farmers have sold their lands to miners who quickly excavated, pumped in water and chemicals and abandoned their pits when the work was done or the show just chased them away. And that's what the picture shows. So you see Kweku Asari sitting there very dejected in the interest of Isikuma, looking at his very badly destroyed cocoa farm. And then in the distance, you can see soldiers chasing miners away from a, um, another pit close to him. So these are some of the things that bring out the, the whole aspect of, would you even want to give out your farm to, for, for, for people to mine? So the farm, farming and mining conflict is not a new thing. The literature talks a lot about it. Several studies have tried to find out, is it a threat? Is it a compliment? Because the argument and the debate is still ongoing. So majority of farmers feel that, look, you will have to engage in these activities at a time because sometimes you are unemployed, there's a lean season, you need quick money, cocoa um, farming does not pay well. So that nexus still continues. But for me, I think that the main thing, the main research issues that I sought to unearth here is the fact that the decision making process is not just about perceptions. There could be some state policies. And here I introduced this three tenure policy, which we used as an underground basis for carrying out the research. And what we what the study then sought to do was to look to address the gap in understanding how such an intervention plays a role in the critical decision making process. Does it bring in more complexities or it makes the decision making process simple for them? And it answers the question, does this alternative actually then deter the farmer from cutting down their cocoa tree for gold? And for them, does it mean that they've taken away their intergenerational wealth or they believe that even after they've cut down their cocoa tree for gold, they have actually satisfied um, the need to provide more wealth for their generations. So I carved out an objective of a study from the data that we gathered. As I said, it is a, it's a huge data set. So we had different um, objectives, but this was my objective for this particular paper. So I looked at the complexities of decision-making faced by farmers in the cocoa producing areas of Southwestern Ghana. And the study area is Western and Western North regions. 
So where this tree tenure program has been introduced on giving up their farmlands for gold mining. The study area, as I said, is southwestern Ghana, collected data from four districts in western region, Wasamevi, east Wasamevi, West Jomoro and Elembele, then two districts in western north region, Bia West and Jabusu. All these are ecological forest zones. They are also mining areas and they are heavy, areas that are heavy in cocoa growing. Of course, they also grow other farm crops and maize, coconut, and some of them do rubber as well. But we specifically were interested in farmers who were also growing cocoa. Um, 11 study communities we mapped out in this district was a Kropon, Edusa, Sankegua, Asankrabin, Kwabin, all the way to New Sanfu. And they are across this district. And we selected the study areas purposely, firstly, because we had to make sure that there was alluvial mining. Alluvial mining is where um, streams deposit um, different types of resources, you know, so carries a resource there. It becomes a huge deposit there, and you need to actually till and excavate to be able to get your mineral deposits out. They also had to be cocoa growing, of course, a natural factor, um, which was, um, was, was, was a base factor for us to collect data. And then the presence of the tree registration program, because we wanted to see if this state policy was introducing a more complex decision-making process, or it was simplifying the process for our respondents. Our approach, rapid appraisal, so we wanted to acquire a comprehensive understanding of the social and ecological processes in a short amount of time, as prescribed by Russell and Hashbecker. And we collected our data between August and December 2020, purely qualitative study, key informant interviews and focus group discussions carried out across the 11 communities. And as the rapid appraiser would, would do, we actually formed the researchers, we formed um, two to three members of our team, researchers with different expertise and a technical person. As I said, I come from a background, University of Ghana, studied very well and has done a lot of studies in mining and natural resources. My colleague um, Rita has done both in natural resources. She's done timber, she's done in um, forestry, and she's also done mining. And then we had an ex expert from um, the US Forestry Services Department, um, Casey Cassandra Johnson, who also had a lot of expertise in this area. She was actually involved in the whole tree registration and tree tenure um, implementation here in Ghana. And then we had our technical person who works for Forig Ghana, and he has also um, been very, very experienced and has been involved in the implementation of the tree tenure processes across the districts that we went to. Our target population, so it was very purposive. And considering this whole aspect of um, mining and illegal mining in Ghana, say, it is almost impossible now to draw a, a, a sample without snowballing in these areas because they will, they, the, the, the respondents will actually not speak to you if they don't trust you. So we had to make sure that we got introduced to some of the respondents. They knew that it was a purely um, academic exercise where we were collecting data, not to go and report to any of the forces that had been um, put out. So you have the Galam stop and all of those who are going around. So if you were not careful, you wouldn't get the data that you want. So we were very purposive. We looked for farmers, farmers who had mined intermittently, miners, mine sponsors. So some of the mine sponsors, we call the financiers. So you find that there are people who actually don't engage in mining. This is that they just fund mining or they put in their money and then they wait for their returns. Okay. So basically, I'll just go straight to my findings here. The first thing is within the the sphere of the tree tenure policy. I just want to explain something. That government's position, actually, in this whole tree tenure thing, um, is not hasn't really been totally decided. Okay, so um, government actually just came out in recently in 2020 in a paper called the Final Benefit Sharing Plan for the Ghana Cocoa Forest Red Program, in, and it was a Forestry Commission initiative where they have now endorsed and the cadastral tree registry. So it means you can have a tree on your farm and you can register it. But it does not allow the farmers to own the naturally regenerated trees. So meaning that if you are a farmer, a cocoa farmer, and you plant a tree on your farm, you can now register the tree and own it and have some paperwork. But if you have a naturally grown tree on your farm, that one does not belong to you. So despite the fact that they're going to enforce this new tree reg um, registration regulation, Farmers are not still convinced that their farmlands have become more valuable. 
Because obviously, if you have timber or different species of tree on your farmland, and you can register it, and the registration process means that you are able to measure the trunk of the tree so that as the tree grows, you know the value and you know what it's adding to your farmland. But the fact that the naturally grown trees do not belong to the farmer is already a bit there. And in our context of growing trees to protect farmlands, there still remains several competing factors that would influence the farmer's decision then to give out their land for various purposes. Generally in Ghana, our land and our tree tenure arrangements actually rely both on customary and statutory interpretations. So customarily, if you go and farm on someone's land or you go onto someone's land and you are even going to grow um, cocoa or whatever you're going to grow, the customary practice is that if you go and meet any tree on it, it does not belong to you. It belongs to the owner of the land. Now, when we introduce the state policy on the tree tenure arrangement, the cadastral one that says that you can now own the trees, the government itself also has an overriding policy arrangement that says that they can give out concessions for people to go and cut trees. And this includes where there are cocoa farms. So if I'm aware of these arrangements, I do not have the motivation to keep planting trees on my farm. Because the interesting thing is that the day the concession is given out, the person comes and cuts every tree. So for a long time, open shade growing up and open sky, like the sun growing cocoa was, was going on for a long time. But it re they realized that it is also one of the factors that reduces the output of cocoa. So where cocoa grows in wetlands, in agroforestry zones, and there's a tree shade cover over it, it helps the cocoa to grow faster. So in actual fact, this policy then would also in, in, encourage cocoa farmers to plant trees on their farms. It helps their cocoa to grow. And at the same time, it increases the value of the, of, of, of the land. Okay. So in a move to make all of this um, work, that's why the US federal government advocated for this new legislation so that people would now be able to say that apart from the fact that the tree is benefiting my cocoa tree, it has also made my land more valuable. Um, so the tree registration policy then would allow farmers to plant trees as proof of ownership. They have their paperwork and um, hopefully this would influence their decision not to cut down their cocoa trees for mining. The study found that there are two general positions being expressed by the farmers or respondents. The main thing is that some of them just have an adamant rejection of mining. So whether they have a tree registered on their farm or not, they don't care. They just rejected mining. They said they don't want mining. And it's because of the negative implications and experience that they have seen with mining. But there are other respondents who were uncertain because for them, the cash benefits that you get from mining, irrespective of the tree benefits, they think that they would that those cash benefits would always outweigh the tree benefits. So for them, whether they, they would have a tree on their cocoa farm and the tree would add value, um, value to their land and they had paperwork that proved that the tree was for them and therefore no concession owner or anybody could come and then take the tree off for whatever reason, they still said no. They are uncertain about the fact that they would give out. So for them, the propensity was that if they were going to get more money from mining, they would cut down their cocoa tree and they would give up the land for mining. So I delve a bit further into this first finding when we talk about rejection of mining and people who regard farming as more sustainable. It confirms the negative implications of mining that we see in the literature. Specifically, farmers share that selling the farms for mining poses a threat to the farmer's source of livelihood and undermines the long-term benefits of the farmlands to future generations. So these are the farmers who are more are thinking more about the generational wealth. How do I make sure that I can conserve my land for generations to come? We also perceive that such is even more a more sustainable source of income as compared to mining. And some of the quotes are here. We have not seen mining activities in our area. We will not approve of them coming because we we'll lose our source of livelihood. This Robert, a farmer from New Sanfo in Elembele district. Others talk about for cocoa is from generation to generation. This is the evidence of the intergenerational wealth that comes from the belief that it doesn't matter what, we will not go into farming. So they will maintain their land and their farm well. It will last them long. They believe that what they'll get from gold is just temporary. It won't go on forever. This adamant rejection is also seen across in a, a, a farming village called Frenchman Village and also in Jomoro. They say that they will destroy the land and the money they get from mining, they'll just show off with it. They'll use it on non-profitable things. And one day, when they finish squandering the money, there's nothing left. But as for the farm, it's always be there to give you money. So again, we see more evidence of 
the belief in intergenerational wealth going further than the money that you get from uh, mining. The uncertainty, we see a pertinent example in respondents from Kwabe, where we did focus group discussions of women. And the women miners, they are both miners and farmers. That's the interesting thing. They are working on the periphery of mining operations. So they farm, and then when they finish, they go and do mining as well. And they insist that mining has helped regulate and sustain the social order because it gives them income support, especially in times when things are hard. And she, would, she, she actually came out and said, if, if Galamsey is coming onto my land and there are trees on it, we asked her whether you've registered or not. She said, no, I will first check the money I'll get from Galamsey. And if it's more than that which I'll get from the trees, I will sell the land. So for me, if the price the Galamsey operator is offering me is higher than that of the trees, I will sell the land. Now we found that the uncertainty has also been even more complicated by consent with tree registration. So the tree registration exercise did start. It went on well. It was implemented. But the, the respondents hope to have limited information on the tree ownership. They are saying that how do we go ahead now and continue knowing that? Where's the final paperwork? They were directed to go to the different offices of Forestry Commission. Some of them have visited there. They still can't get their paperwork and they don't know what is going on. So in a very interesting way, it seems like because the project was funded, once the funding was suspended, the continuity has not been what it has to be. There's a lot of misconceptions of planting trees in the farms. Some of them are asking, so I plant the tree on the farm and then what happens? Who will come and help me to grow the farm? What about if I'm a migrant and I'm only allowed on the land for 15 years? By the time the tree can benefit me, probably it will be time for me to leave the land. Maybe the landowner will decide that I don't even deserve to have that land anymore. Lack of opportunity to register the trees. As I said, you want to go to which forestry commission office at the district level? Limited supply of seedlings. So they said, they said, look, maybe you give us a farm, you give us wawa, you give us this, but it doesn't come like we want it to. For us in the lean season, we'll pay more attention to the trees. If you tell us, if you bring it and it's available, we'll engage in it, but we don't even have it. And then the fear of chiefs claiming tree ownership was not clear to farmers because the customary law has not been changed. So the customary rights to land says that that the chief still owns a percentage of everything that you put on the land and owns everything that was on the land before you started cultivating it. So realize that this complicates the decision for the farmer as to if you give up his land, you cut his cocoa tree and go ahead to mine or you cut his cocoa tree and give it up for gold. And that brings me to the second important finding for this study. Land tenure and inheritance systems is a huge dilemma of migrants. Our study community showed that there's quite a number of migrants across southwestern Ghana. We found them in Jomoro, Elembele district, especially. And they tell you that consultation with chiefs, community members, farmers, landowners, public officials, and law enforcement is done in land acquisition process. It complicates this for the migrants. So for them, it's not a straightforward thing that says that if I have a cocoa farm and I put trees on it and I increase its value, I will not allow somebody to come and mine it because sometimes the decision making process even does not become theirs. They are not the ones who are going to pass on the land to their children. It is the chief or the family. So the decision making process then goes to rest with them. So you, the cocoa farmer, does not even have the power to say that you, you will or you will not cut down your cocoa tree for gold. So it further complicates the decision making process. So they said, respondents say that it is based on the power wield by the parties involved in the decision making and the discretion of some of the parties, landowners and farmers, we can make the decision. We need to involve other parties in the decision making to give out land to the miners. But they come to realize that most of the time they are left out of the whole consultation process. They will just be there and here comes a concession owner to say that the land has been given out and you would have to move or cut your cocoa trees. Okay. And they tell you, we have some of them farmers who have acquired the land on share cropping arrangements from the landowner. So they are supposed to share the benefits of it. So it is not for them. So the sharecropper has to agree before you can mine. So that you as sharecropper, you can't go and mine on your landowner's land without informing him. So these arrangements are there and they further complicate the decision-making process. I emphasize a little bit more on the land tenure and inheritance systems, where we talk about most of the lands are owned by individuals. Since the chief, the chief rules over the entire land in this community. All the land is supervised by him traditionally as the fall under his jurisdiction. But within the community, every family and clan also has this land. So it even complicates the decision more. So the chief 
cast traditional overview or traditional the traditional overlord of all the land. Then there's a family and there's a clan. Then there's you, the farmer. That means you are going through how many different systems before you can even make a decision about if you should cut down your cocoa tree for gold. So at the end of the day, the farmer believes that the decision making process does not become his. It becomes a complete um, a, a complex um, addition of all these people before they decide that they can cut they will cut his cocoa tree but the cocoa tree is for him before he cuts down his cocoa tree for good the decision making process is complicated by all this land tenure and inheritance systems now the third finding that the study sees is this decreasing value of cocoa and income relative to gold this is very very well discussed in the literature and the study agrees with it and when you listen to what the respondents said, they tell you that inadequate funds for land preparation, they said finding cocoa laborers these days is so difficult. And we found it especially amongst the women. So they will tell you that because if I, if I do not go and engage in mining, at the end of the day, I can't even get enough money to go and employ laborers to now come and work on my cocoa farm. Meanwhile, the prices of cocoa. They don't see it. They don't feel that the prices of cocoa has improved like we see it on the world market and we see it in our export earnings. They believe that the adjustment of the weighing skills is also troubling them because forever and ever, every time they go, they say when they go to the weighing and um, they, they see that the adjustments keep changing. So it becomes problematic for them. Low crop quality and seedlings and high cost of inputs. We talked them about fertilizers and inputs. And they said, no, it is still high compared to the income that they get, even though the government is subsidizing it, it is still high. So they tell you, with that, they are big sack, and they are talking about the sack, because they tell you that they put their cocoa into a sack, but when they get to the weighing there into the cocoa, they possess another sack there, which they now have to transfer it in. And that one, you fill it to the brim. And she said, it's taller than this table here. And that is what can give you the 64 kilos they are looking for which can then fetch me the 475 Ghana cities. Whereas with the gallon say, if I should go and by the grace of God, I'm lucky, within two hours, I can make an amount of about two or 3,000 cities. Even if for nothing at all, what will I get? It, what, what I will get, it will certainly be better than the cocoa. And the cocoa farmers are so adamant when you talk to them about the other benefits that they may be getting from including bonuses, scholarships. They said it doesn't get to them. So all of those things that we think would incentivize people to stay in cocoa, they tell you that they are not getting it. So I conclude this study by looking at this whole decision that, or this investigation that we try to, to, to unearth. Would you down your tree for gold? Would you down your cocoa tree for gold? And we do conclude that it is very complicated. It is based on various pathways. It is based on a myriad of factors. You can have state policies such as a very, very attractive tree tenure policy being effective or ineffective, but it will interplay with customary land and inheritance systems, which is a feature of many, many African countries and especially societies here in Ghana and in especially in cocoa producing areas. The income generation and the price of gold is something that can never compare to cocoa. So what do we then ensure to do that? People are not always consistently comparing price of gold versus price of cocoa and saying that income from, because income from gold will always be higher than income from cocoa. Some of the respondents also perceive and believe strongly that farming as compared to mining is more, is, 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 is a sustainable source of income. They, they are telling you that planting the tree trees are therefore a sustainable way of keeping their farmlands for mining activity. So for them, they will not cut down their cocoa tree. Mining, they know, has negative implications on farming, especially if they sell their farmlands and it becomes a threat to other farmers' source of livelihood and actually undermines the long-term benefits of their farmlands for future generations. But there are still other respondents that believe that mining gives you substantial amounts of financial support. No matter what you do, it is sometimes more viable and that the small and gradual amount of income that you get from that is better wealth for their generations and they will give you quotes to support it. So in the light of all these findings, the study makes very simple recommendations, which I'm hoping I can even develop further. But we believe that more work is actually still needed to encourage smallhold farmers especially to be convinced that the trees and the associated use and market remains a more viable and long-term alternative to mining revenues. Farmers must be presented with a concrete program. So it looks like the program was presented, it was well, they were interested, but it's suspended and has left all of them in 
you know, in doubt about the actual benefits of having more trees to increase your cocoa production. And at the same time, so that when you cut off your cocoa trees, the land is still val valuable because you at least have commercial trees on it. It means that relevant agencies need to provide more education on timber and other forest products. The farmers a lot didn't know a lot about the trees. They need to ensure that this whole registration process is easier and it actually reaches the doorstep of the farmer. So we need to eliminate the bureaucratic challenges. Emphasis in policy circles among smallholder farmers seems to fixate on ownership alone. The legislation or the legislative bit leaves the farmers in the limbo. So you look at the smallholder farmers, you go and give them good ideas. You tell them what to do. There's no proper legislation at the top or there's no little discussion of what will actually translate from this policy for the farmer. And then it leaves the farmer in a confused state. Did you inform my chief that all the trees that you have, I am now planting on the land will be for me? How much, how many other stakeholders have you engaged in this whole thing? So the totality of some of these policies makes it complex. It doesn't allow the farmer to make an easy decision that, hey, I will keep my land now instead of giving that up, or I will, I will keep my cocoa tree and I will not cut it down if somebody should approach me that they have found gold on the land. And there are numerous examples the study participants give about their farms being destroyed by adjacent mining and timber con concessions. And it highlights the truth that even if you have registered your tree, but you haven't insured it, there's, they, 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 do, they don't know how they are going to keep themselves if there's a bushfire or there's a wildfire or there's something, and the commercial tree is also poisoned by mining activities. And I think in a brief, that's a summary of cutting down and um, my cocoa tree, downing my cocoa tree for gold. Adua, I'm done. Thank you very much, um, Antoinette, for this excellent presentation. I really enjoyed and I and I believe that um, the rest of us here also did the same. I think you've spoken a lot about the interplay of the state, market, and customer institutions, and how these are, these are shaping the cocoa mining nexus. And I think it's also more about the everyday livelihood needs versus the long-term intergenerational needs of societies. So um, on this note, I'll open the floor for us to engage with the presentation. Um, we have about 20 minutes of discussion. So um, I would allow the first three people to, um, who have any comments, suggestions, questions, um, so that Antoinette can um, respond and then we can go to the second round. So kindly um, react by raising your hand and I will call Hello. you to... to um, yes, and who is speaking, please? George. George, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Madam President, uh, let me congratulate you for that excellent delivery. I think um, uh, it has revealed quite Most of what you said coincides with a discussion that I had with the radio station this morning. Um, it had to do with uh, how do we improve our current position. And many have come out to do away with our wish scribe, as it were, Ed Gracia, uh, and so many other conversations going on out there. And so this morning, when I joined the conversation, I picked cocoa. And my interest in cocoa was due to the fact that uh, every year globally, cocoa is contributing $115 billion. Uh, I mean, to the global economy, cocoa. Ghana um, is the second leading producer of cocoa, as you already mentioned. We produce 23% of the beans globally. Uh, interestingly, ours is the most quality. And so anybody producing chocolate anywhere in the world would always have inscription Ghana on their chocolate just to boost their sales. We sit here in Ghana, Belgium gets $114 billion from cocoa every year. And that is bigger than our budget. Our budget currently is $137 billion. And so $1 to 10 cities means that Belgium always would get $14 billion from cocoa. And if Ghana becomes a little bit wiser like Belgium, what we get from cocoa will be far bigger than our budget, so we wouldn't be here talking about 207 million. That is paid for years. We wouldn't be here talking about those things at all. And so I have seen that, uh, Madam Speaker, we have, as a country, we have failed to, 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 to use what is ours, to benefit from what is ours. And so this cocoa 
we are producing uh, for others to benefit. U.S. receives the highest, um, you know, amount of revenue from cocoa annually in the region of our 20 billion. So in your study, you talked about uh, the U.S. government having interest in this study. What quickly came to my mind was that is there interest for to improve our situation or to keep uh, the, the the global order of Ghana producing raw cocoa beans to supply to U.S. chocolate uh, giant chocolate manufacturing companies so that uh, every year they will get their twenty billion dollars improve their situation over there. We sit here and we get nothing. Uh, and so I I I will be grateful if you will shed light on that. What is the interest of U.S. government in the cocoa? Is it to help our cause or for or to sustain that supply? <laughs> that that Thank has been going on. Much, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, lastly, you, lastly, mm -hmm. yeah, lastly, la lastly, uh, Madam, try and uh, help us to understand what informed the choice for uh, the 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 districts that you mentioned. I heard about it, and I think I was breaking. I didn't hear so much about it. Uh, uh, the main reason why you chose those districts. Thanks so much for that excellent and interesting presentation. Thanks. Thank you, George. Um, I'll see if there are other hands raised before I, I give um, Antoine the opportunity to respond. Are there any burning questions or comments? And please also, when you have um, questions, you just try and be smart about it so we can have a lot more discussions. Okay, Antoinette, then please, you can go ahead with your response to George's question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Adjoa, and thank you, George. So, George, for the first question about the U.S. interest, I think my colleague, um, Professor Cassandra Johnson, Jathia, is actually online and she joined us. So she's my colleague from the U.S., um, I think, State Forestry Department who joined us. And it's purely for research purposes. It's not about the fact that they are interested. In fact, the, the initial aim of carrying out the study was about the tree tenure policy and to see if um, the tree tenure policy had actually dissuaded most farmers from um, cutting down their... So that interplay between forest mining and the tree tenure as um, a factor within it. So my um, paper that I'm looking at, I've picked a, an aspect of this study and I'm looking at cocoa. So you'll find that the farmers that we interviewed are not purely only cocoa farmers, but they do have other crops as well, but they are mainly growing cocoa. So they are, the interest is not about our cocoa or what they want to do about our cocoa. It's about the fact that um, trees, the trees would offer shade, help our cocoa to grow better. And then it will also help us to improve the value of our land. But the main thing was about the registration of the trees, how you make farmers own their trees. So we are moving from a, 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 tree, a, a policy of where farmers do not own those trees to a stage where now at least the ones that you plant are owned by you. So that's a bit of um, information there. As to what informed the choice of the district, I explained to you that along the southwestern part of Ghana, there's a huge agroecological zone. So we were looking for districts that grow cocoa, predominantly the farmers they grow cocoa, and also these are these same districts you would find um, mining. And it also falls in the forest zone, meaning that in these places you would find already existing trees on people's cocoa farms, and they would also have the propensity or the likelihood that they would have planted their own trees. So that's what informed the district. Of course, these were also the districts where the study was um, or the, the, the study was actually carried out previously on the tree tenure policy and, and how it had been implemented. So it was purposively chosen for these reasons. These are also the districts, if you look at when we mapped out the district, these are the districts with the highest incidence of Galamsey in the southwestern belt of Ghana. So you find a lot more illegal mining on the high side in these districts. So that is why we purposely chose these districts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and um, Adjoan, there's well. another thing. Yeah. In that in that area, um, in those districts, um, when you look at the cocoa producing areas in, in Ghana, about 50, I think one of the slides I showed it, about 50, about 57% of cocoa production actually comes from southwestern Ghana. So it was it was very, very um, important that we purposely choose districts in this area. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, maybe just to come in a, a, a bit on George's question, I'm just thinking about the rationale behind the, the, the tree tenure policy. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. would you say the misplaced policy direction when you think about the fact that what the state should be doing is to be improving the value chain, you know, in the cocoa sector to make it more profitable for the farmers, for the people and for the, in the, in the country. So would you say that is a misplaced like um, policy direction in terms of what Ghana actually needs for the cocoa sector instead of putting trees in cocoa farms to increase the value of the cocoa farms? Would you say that? Um, I wouldn't say that it's misplaced at all because there's also a lot of studies and evidence that shows that cocoa production has actually led to deforestation in Ghana because there's a lot of um, cocoa farmers who also just cut down all the trees on their land and then they go ahead and plant cocoa. And looking at the life cycle of cocoa, the life cycle of commercial trees far um, is higher than that of cocoa. And then the success of a cocoa tree versus the success of having a commercial tree. So if you have over, um, let's say, 10 hectares of cocoa trees and you have a success of maybe 60 to 70 percent, but if you have commercial trees on the land as well, whatever happens to your cocoa trees, your commercial trees would usually stay, stay. you know, they would always grow strong. So the pest and disease, I mean, susceptibility to pest and diseases and all of that is higher with your cocoa trees than it is with your commercial trees. So apart from the fact that it would improve and increase the value of your land, it's also a more sustainable income source because at any point in time, if you have to cut down your cocoa trees, at least you have the commercial trees there to keep, you, you know, that can also bring you some income. It's alternative income. It also offers shade and there's um, scientific evidence that cocoa growing under shade has higher productivity than the open sun and um, open sun type of growing cocoa. So it definitely cannot be a misplaced policy, the tree tenure policy. It is, it's just that I think the implementation processes are always, um, you know, a bit face challenges, especially when um, it is being funded by an external partnership. And even though with this one, yes, there was a partnership with Forestry Commission and everything, but we realized that once the funding period and it became difficult for the state agency to actually follow up and ensure that more, more and more benefits is being accrued to the very farmers who had taken the seedlings. They have planted the trees. There was evidence a lot of them had the trees on, but they don't know what to do with the trees. You know, the whole concept of the implementation of the policy sounded so good to them that from now on, if you plant a tree, you would own it. But what next? So we, we read about, I, I read a lot about the policy. So we, they should have taught them how to measure. Some of them have even forgotten. Some of them don't even know where they should go to. So the lack of information and details is what is actually um, making the whole tree tenure policy lack the very, very benefits that it should have brought to the farmers. And that is what is making the decision-making process complex for them because then they ask themselves, I have the trees on my farm. I know it has made my land more valuable and et cetera, but will I go ahead and cut the, and go ahead and cut my cocoa tree for mining? I can't decide because I don't know what is really going to happen to that tree on my land. And there's um, um, my colleagues and I have already come out on one publication in Society and Natural Resources on um, saying that when will my tree grow for me to benefit from it? And it was a significant finding in one of the communities. The, the, the farmer said, yes, I will plant the tree. Yes, I will be very encouraged. But what I ask you is that I need money immediately. When will that tree grow for me to benefit from it? So these are some of the findings of the study. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Antoinette. I see in the comments here from Johnson Cassandra that um, some farmers also give over old cocoa farms for Galamse so they can have their cake and eat it, so to yes. speak. And that is both cocoa yeah. farming continues while profiting from mining. That's also an interesting one. Um, are there any more com comments or questions? You can always jump in. Um, Jonathan, please go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you very much, Doug, for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little more about the migrant uh, uh, farmers um, in terms of their um, 
uh, intergenerational wealth. What is intergenerational wealth to them? Um, in, in the case of the concession owners, you know, I see that they may have a, a different sense of uh, intergenerational wealth, and then the concession owners may have a, a, a different uh, idea of it. So, can you talk a little bit about it? Can I go ahead, Adjo? Yes, please, you can. Thank you. Okay, so I would just give you, I wish I could share this slide, but I'll just give you a, a short. So from our study, we had about, um, I think about, okay, so it's qualitative, but we did have a good number of the farmers being migrants. And about 33 out of the 72 farmers we interviewed were migrants. So it was quite a significant number. So there's quite a high number of migrants in the um, farming, cocoa farming areas. And when we talked about intergenerational wealth, so I am um, measuring or de deciding that this intergenerational wealth comes first of all from the number of years you have actually been growing cocoa. So it is easier for you to hand over your cocoa farm to your, your child, to your child's child and et cetera meaning that you have leased the land for a certain number of years. And that number of years supersedes the number of years that you are going to grow cocoa on your farm. So if you lease the land for 45 to 50 years, then you are able to transfer the wealth on your cocoa farm from one, one generation to the other. And we found that in the community. So you ask them, they'll tell you that it was my father who first settled here who had been growing cocoa, and I have now come. We found a lot of evidence, especially in Frenchman village, where the man actually owns, it's like a whole, he owns the whole community. And what he has done is, as laborers work on his farm, he's able to give them portions of the cocoa farm, which now belongs to them. So you work, he pays you, and eventually you get to own a share in that cocoa farm. And here you'll find families living their people, their children, their grandchildren, who now are all part of this wealth process that he has created in the community. So for migrants, we realize that the fact that I can hand over wealth from my generation to the other would encourage me to hold on to my cocoa farm. Okay, But where I cannot make a decision on handing over wealth from my generation to the other, the decision-making process is so complex and is taken out of my hands. It is not for me to be able to decide that I can hand over the wealth in my generation to the other. And then we look at farmers in Asempanaye and um, the other areas, Asankegua, Wasekropong, where there are heavy mining, there was heavy mining being undertaken. These are people who do not think about the fact that, because they are not migrants, they actually own the land themselves, either they are families or they are clans or whatever it is. So they own an aspect of the land. They've been farming for generations. So they have cocoa farms that has been handed to them. But we found rather that they are the ones who are able to quickly make a decision as to if they want immediate wealth or they will hand over the generational wealth that has been handed over to them. They will also hand it over to their children. So those were some of the dynamics that they study found out. Thank you, Antoinette. Um, we have Sandra. Hello, Sandra, are you there? Hello. Thank you very much, yes. um, Dr. Cool. for sharing this piece. Uh, and I would want to find out, um, with the tree registration um, process that that um, seemed to take place, um, the, this study found out the rates um, at which the trees um, have been registered. Um, I mean, what was the number of farmers um, who have had the opportunity to register their their trees, and um, does this registration give a full assurance that um, the farmer may not face any form of, you know, um, timber logging or cutting of these trees in the near future. And um, permit me if probably you have addressed this, but I joined in a bit late. And, and so I would also want to know 
um, which agency is responsible for ensuring that um, the trees are registered? Is it with Cocoa Board? Is it with the Forestry uh, Commission? Or is it a joint, you know, initiative just so that there is some form of security when these trees are, are, are registered? Thank you. So generally, the the um, the tree registration. Okay, so we didn't have like a quantitative like head count of the farmers who had registered their trees or not. There were there was a question in the instrument that asked. Of course, we knew that in all these communities that we went to, the policy would have been introduced to them at some time. So it has been there, and that's why we revisited there. And um, so we would find that in some of the focus group discussions, you find two or three of them who have said, yes, I have tried to register my tree. Some would say I haven't tried to register. So it varies. So I can't really speak to the fact that about 50% had registered or 100% had registered. It probably, I probably need to look more into the data to do it. But one thing that I can speak about is the fact that the interest in registration was very high. Um, but I believe that the the study finds that the understanding possibly did not get to the level where it to motivate them enough to register. And the registration processes also were a bit complicated in a way because you needed a, a paper when you finish. So you needed a paper and you needed to keep measuring as your tree was growing so that your value was also increasing. And perhaps the farmers did not grasp all of these things as they should have because that would have really helped the process. In, in terms of who is in charge, Forestry Commission, so the District Office of Forestry Commission is now supposed to handle it. And some of them will tell you that they visited the Forestry Commission offices several times. And the, I think there isn't a specific desk set up for this. I think one part is if we had gone ahead and done a little bit of institutional data collection, maybe we would have gotten the other side of the story. But this is what we concentrated on. The, the farmers, their perceptions, their decision-making process, and what actually um, has gone into them saying that they would keep their land because of the tree tenure policy and not give it up for mining. I hope this answers your question. So that was mainly it. We didn't do a proper head count because we did interviews and focus group discussions. So I, I'm not mixing the respondents together to do a head count. But there was a number of them who were who were so um, expressed their opinions very, very um deeply about the fact that they had tried consistently to register their trees but they hadn't there were some who had registered but there was also a, a number of them who said they had grown the trees for i think the, the program was in um 2018 that's when it suspended so they said we've had the trees that you some of them even pointed the five to six year old trees for us like good trees but they didn't have a means of being able to register and know the value that the tree had added to their land much okay so that was mainly some of we, we are i mean i am hoping that i can do further investigation and analysis of this once this paper is done and see if there's an institutional perspective on this whole tree tenure policy and if it has worked or it hasn't worked so i think that would also be another area that hopefully the team would would want to look at in the future thank you Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Ajua. Thank you very much, um, Antoinette. Um, one last question. Do they sell the lands outright or they rent them out? That's a very interesting question. The study finds that overwhelmingly, both miners and farmers said that they had either leased or sold their land for mining because of immediate financial gains that they had received. So it's both those who had given it out they had leased it, and some of them had sold it outright. And as I said, the decision is complex. It doesn't only rest on them. It rests on a whole lot of factors before the farmer will decide if I will sell or I would lease. So we found a mixture of both. We actually also then found farmers who are also mining their lands. Okay, But um, as Casey and Cassandra pointed out, we also found farmlands, that old cocoa farmlands that had been given up. OK, and that's when they had been sold totally because the farmer had come to a conclusion that there is no way they can ever grow any cocoa on it before. So this time they had gone ahead and sold it for 
for, for mining. But one of the things that we so, saw, the research participants what, didn't make any distinction between licensed and illegal, you know, lines like the small scale mining. Everything for them is small scale mining. They don't distinguish between the one that is legal or is not legal. So they will sell their land for mining, irrespective of if the person coming to them is coming to do galamsey or not. And we believe that that is one of the reasons why environmental destruction is so high in these cocoa growing areas. Because it, obviously, if the land is not licensed, you cannot hold the person who is coming to mine on it responsible. Okay, so that was a, a finding that, that, that also came up. All right. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Tibodako and everybody. Um, we have exhausted our time. And so I would like to say thank you again for making time to join this interesting conversation. Let's keep talking. Let's um, keep having these discussions. Our next seminar is on the 16th of February, and we hope to have all of you also there. On that note, I'll say have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Cassandra. And thank you, all my colleagues who helped to make this, this a very, very interesting and successful project and presentation. I have a quick question, though. How do you get invited to the next presentation? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's about the link. Is Adra still here? Francis, you are asking that question, isn't it? Yeah, that's Francis. Okay, so most of the time we, 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 we post the flyer and the link on the CSPS website as well. So if okay. you go there, you'll get it. But I would be also good to share it with you. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, great presentation. Really learned a lot. Thank you.